And like that, investment in the situation skyrockets. One advantage that fan fictions have over original works is that it's much easier for the audience to become invested, as they're already invested in the source material. Just by revealing that the captured, terrified pony is Twilight Sparkle, the stakes are raised much higher. The result being an instant increase in tension. Also on a quick side note, the fact that an anti-magic brace is secured around Twilight is stated twice. I'll refer you to my earlier tirade regarding concise writing. As we near the halfway point, her name is finally specifically mentioned when Nexus told Twilight that the cult served Nightmare Moon. While I do question the wisdom of revealing this outright, Twilight is completely bound, unable to fight back, and completely surrounded by dozens of hostile ponies. Unless you're a Jedi, I don't care how skilled at fighting you are, you will lose if you're so heavily outnumbered. In Nexus's mind, he's already won the battle so he's overconfident. Thus the gloating makes sense. But there's something I want to emphasize here. Nexus told Twilight about Nightmare Moon. Keep that in mind for later. In the meantime, we've got a resurrection spell to begin, and it's absolutely dripping in suspense. For context, think about the melee weapons we see in the show and movie. Only swords and spears, and we very rarely see them used in actual combat. So when Nexus pulls out a dagger, and intends to use it. Well, while we're certain there are thresholds that the show and movie won't cross, this is a fan fiction. We don't know what's out of bounds. This uncertainty breeds suspense for the scene. I gotta hand it to Penstroke. He knows how to keep your attention glued to the page. So Nexus kicked Twilight in the stomach, knocking the air from her lungs, and drew the blade across one of her legs drawing only a few drops of blood, thankfully. Twilight screamed from pain and fear as this is going on. If you're wondering how Twilight managed to scream while the air is knocked from her lungs, good for you. With Twilight's role in the prologue essentially over, the focus returns to Nexus where he begins his motivational speech. It's meant to be like a sermon, but Nexus isn't really preaching anything here. He talks about how their efforts after two years are finally bearing fruit. They're going to bring Nightmare Moon back to life and conquer Equestria. It's certainly successful in firing them up, but this raises another question. Earlier in the prelude, it's said that Nexus is well practiced in preaching. What was he preaching exactly? I can certainly understand discussing plans. How to keep everything in the shadows, how to kidnap Twilight Sparkle, etc, etc. But preaching? Maybe it's like Rainbow Dash's fan club, where they only talk about how awesome Nightmare Moon is. So they begin the spell proper, and there's some real nice use of imagery here. Oil-soaked powders and wooden bowls lit with blue flames, placed around lines of power on the ground, also glowing blue. The blood from the dagger forming a sphere then turning black from the smoke billowing from the central bowl. It's eerie, dreadful, and beautiful. Love it. Things reach a tense climax when Nexus realizes that the spell is working. And right when it seems that Nightmare Moon's return is inevitable, a lightning bolt strikes the center of the spell, effectively nullifying it, and the black sphere seems to vanish. Suddenly, a battalion of royal guards flies down from the sky, and the battle between them and the cultists begin. Then Celestia herself comes down and joins the fray. If you didn't, jump up shouting, WHOA, THIS IS SO AWESOME! Then I commend you for your self-restraint. However, I wish there was more of a focus on the battle, more detail. All we actually get is that it's happening, and Celestia completely owns any pony that tries to attack her. If there were descriptions such as, Celestia shielded herself from a unicorn's beam, then responded in kind to much better effect. Or, 
she levitated a cultist that pinned one of her guards to the ground and threw her to the other side of the clearing. This would have made for a much juicier battle sequence, as would erasing a certain phrase during this scene. Turning his eyes skyward, Nexus glared at the next figure to float down through the hole in the clouds. With a single flash of her horn, the figure brushed away the cloud cover like froth from a cup of hot cocoa. W what? Yeah, because nothing fits the tone of an intense battle and dramatic rescue quite like a... cup of hot cocoa? See, this is why word choice matters, people. It's jarring to see circumstances as fantastic as this compared to something so mundane. It breaks the tone of the scene, and as a result, immersion is broken with it. Anyway, Nexus quickly realizes that they're fighting a losing battle, so he calls the remaining cultists to him, then casts a mass invisibility spell, and the group disappears. There'll be a problem for another day, but in the meantime, Twilight is rescued! Hooray! So everyone returns to Ponyville, to the Golden Oaks Library, and Twilight is sent to bed. For the remainder of the night, Celestia guards her student personally and has the guards report to her as she has them search the forest for the cultists. Penstroke captures Celestia's character, and her relationship to Twilight, especially well here. It's no secret that she's meant to be the mother figure of the show, not just to Twilight, but to all the ponies of Equestria. And just like a protective mother, she doesn't take Twilight's kidnapping lightly commanding her guards to get to the bottom of everything as quickly as possible, while making sure she sleeps soundly and safely that night. A very nice scene overall. But... Unfortunately, Twilight had her head covered by a thick sack for most of her pony napping. She doesn't know enough for us to ascertain this group's purpose. Wait, what? Okay, let's jump back to that point I told you to remember. Spell Nexus told Twilight to her face that they served Nightmare Moon. You would think that'd be critical information that Twilight would tell Celestia right away. She didn't so much as mention it? Well, I guess not. Now, some of you may be thinking she was under severe emotional distress. You can't think clearly in that state. Well, dear viewers, you would be right. Except she's not under emotional distress. She's perfectly fine in Chapter 1. In fact, she's more annoyed about it than anything else. There is no in-story explanation. Twilight, you done goofed. Now, this is a contrivance meant to serve the narrative to come. If she had mentioned it, the story would have turned out very differently. Perhaps not as good as it is now. But it's a contrivance nonetheless. If Nexus hadn't mentioned Nightmare Moon specifically, instead merely hinting at Equestria's true queen, and Twilight mentioned that to Celestia, the story would have carried forward like normal. But the contrivance would be erased, and there's the added bonus of Twilight becoming more competent when she puts two and two together later. Just my two cents there. And now finally, we've come to the final scene of the prelude, where the guards have just finished cleaning up the clearing where the resurrection spell took place, and about to join the search parties hunting the cultists. There's a short but humorous exchange between the lieutenant and one of the recruits. After such an intense series of events, some levity is certainly welcome. But upon first glance, this dialogue doesn't seem to serve any purpose. It doesn't further the plot in any way, and these characters, who aren't even named, never show up again. These are noteworthy drawbacks to this scene, but there actually is a purpose behind it. But let's stick a pin in that for now, we'll get back to it. Now, there is a rather sudden transition between points of view here. So the guards leave the clearing, but the focus shifts from them to the black sphere hidden from their view. Turns out it was just launched clear from the center of the spell, and the cultists were too distracted by the lightning bolts and the guards to notice where it went. What makes this part jarring is that up until this point, the book seemed to be in third-person limited point of view. That's where the story is told in third person, but you're only aware of one character's thoughts at a time, and the scene is told from that character's perspective. It could be one character for the entire story, a handful of characters, or a lot of characters. 
but there is a kind of POV that's far less common, which is actually used for past sins, and that is third-person omniscient. The difference is that in this version, you're privy to information that the character or characters in the scene don't know about. Now, there's nothing wrong with this style. It allows for quite a bit of flexibility and ease in moving the plot forward, as well as greater control over the story's pacing. The downside, however, is that the sense of closeness that Third Person Limited provides is considerably less effective, as individual characters don't get as much of the focus in a single scene. As it stands, this sudden departure from any characters is distracting. It left me wondering who exactly was watching the sphere draw in the magic and grow larger. And of course, there's no one. There should have been a statement to clue the audience in towards the beginning. Something like, a pack of timber wolves ran close by, but the unicorn didn't notice them. Statements like this sprinkled throughout would tell the audience that this was done purposefully, so it wouldn't be a surprise when the story moves away from the characters. Also, I'm going to dive into nitpicking territory one last time. The ending shows the sphere completing the spell on its own, eventually forming its own heartbeat. But the book describes it as a pitter-patter. Okay, cutesy words, take away from the ominous, foreboding tone, distracting, breaks immersion, yada yada, moving on. Besides that, however, the tone is successfully achieved, and leaves a very nice cliffhanger ending. One that I'm glad to say is addressed in the first chapter, and not a cliffhanger for cliffhanger's sake. Now, under most circumstances, this would be the point where I wrap things up. But there's actually one final aspect I want to address. Some of you may be wondering the same thing I wondered when I first started reading Past Sins. Why is the first part called a prelude? Why not a prologue? While they aren't exact synonyms, it is true that there is a lot of overlap within their definitions. Did Penstroke choose that word just to be different? To stand out? Well, it's possible, but after doing some light digging, I've arrived to a much more interesting conclusion. And by light digging, I mean I looked up the definition of prelude. It's a preliminary to an action, event, condition, or work of a broader scope and higher importance. And this surprises literally no one. So why did I bring this up? Well, consider this. If the main body of the work is the broader scope, then the prelude is of the same vein, just on a smaller scope. It encapsulates everything the main body is about, and gives it to the audience in bite-sized pieces. This is exactly what Resurrection does. Not only does it get the plot rolling and set the sticks for the book, not only does it establish characters that will receive the lion's share of the focus, both new and old, but it takes the ideas of past sins and craft a story out of them. The foreboding atmosphere, the harsh and intense tone, the themes of facades and motherhood, cloak and dagger tactics that lead to open rebellion, and even the odd bit of humor. Oh yes, it's easy to forget that past sins can be pretty funny sometimes. Even the overall writing quality is captured, where there is a flaw here and there, but they don't overshadow what past sins does so right. It could be I'm reading too deep into this, but hey, that's what close reading is all about. When all is said and done, the prelude is a great start to a great fanfiction, and I, for one, can't wait for what comes next. My name is Contro, and until next time, good day and good night.